This is Duke University. This, this um, talk is a kind of condensation of some of the arguments made in the book I published a couple years ago called Blood and Water. Um, so it may be a bit of a gallop through, uh, but um, I, I hope it will hang together. And I've tried to respond to uh, Prasenjit's direction that we should orient things around turning points. So I've got two. <laughs> so um, the, the subject is the Indus Basin. And, and what I want to really talk about here is the concept of the river basin as a construct very closely associated with framings of political power and the way that power is related to nature. Um, this is a map of the uh, rough outline of the, the Indus Basin, that is the drainage area of the, the Indus and all its uh, tributaries. Um, in point of fact, the concept that I'll be talking about has less to do with the actual bounded space, because these uh, actual boundaries are all as is the case with most river basins, quite remote, uh, up in the mountains and, and in no way ever very clearly marked. But the significance of the river basin lays in the way that it creates this concept of a natural entity which um, uh, states, and I'll discuss in this case it's a variety of states, uh, attempt to found the moral foundations of their rule through, through an association. So I have relied here on Francois Mal's discussion of this, uh, where he lays out very clearly that the river basin, though it's very commonly used in all kinds of technical discourse about rivers nowadays, but nevertheless has a long history related to its, uh, its, the cultural meanings imputed to it. So before I talk about how this came to be, I, I just want to say a quick word about the Indus River Basin uh, in a history that goes back well before the concept of the river basin was used, and in fact, I haven't found any reference to the uh, river basin going back before the middle of the 19th century, at least in the context of the, of the Indus Basin. But nevertheless, having said that, I, I want to make the point that there are various ways that we can think about a river system as having certain characteristics which create a certain commonality to our discussions about how peoples who inhabit that region interact with nature, interact with the river. And this is very much the case with the um, Indus Basin. Um, there are some very striking characteristics of the river basin and its flow, which have had a big impact on how the river has been used. And one of these is that there is a considerable amount of silt in the Indus uh, river system, not as much as in the Yellow River, but nevertheless quite considerable, which, um, as in the case of the Yellow River, has led to uh, uh, frequent shifts in course as uh, silt has built up and as the river has shifted. So there's a very long history of this, which I might add has never been laid out anywhere near as clearly as the maps that, that you showed us for the the Yellow River. Um, but there's another feature which is really critical, which is that uh, there is a huge variability in flow in the Indus system. So, I mean, this is common in many systems, but in the Indus case, something around 85% of the annual flow of the river comes during the six months between April and October. So that means the remaining uh, six months have 
I mean, this varies from year to year, but approximately 15% of the total annual flow. So there's a huge difference. So what happens is the system is marked by extreme floods during the, the um, summer months. And, but beyond that, the floods are quite variable from year to year. So all this has had a, a profound impact, uh, one of which is to make it, though, though this, this region, as I'll discuss in a second, is today known for the very extensive canal system based on the Indus. But historically, the construction of canals has been a huge problem because of the character of this flow. So in fact, um, we don't really know when the earliest canals were built. Most people who work on the ancient Indus Valley civilization believe that there were not canals during that period, that it was probably floods and then basins were constructed similar to what, what people was talking about, uh, where the floodwaters would be enclosed and then would sink in uh, to allow for a rubby crop to, to be grown. But, but by the, the 19th century, and, and this map, though it shows a few late 19th century features, would not have been too different from the map from the late 18th century. There were a very large number of what were called inundation canals that were built. Some of these go back, we have some evidence going back into the, the medieval period, but there seems to have been a great expansion of construction of these in the 18th century. And what marks an inundation canal or a seasonal canal is that it fills up with water during the summer months. And then when the river flow, falls, it runs completely dry. So these canals took off the river. Um, the interesting thing about them from a, uh, a political economy point of view is that they also require very high labor inputs because due to the silt, these canals will run usually for only two or three years at the most if they're not actually cleaned out of silt every year because with the floods, they, they fill up. So they very quickly lose their ability to carry water, which means that annually considerable labor has to be mobilized to clean out the canals to, to let them function. So the problems in building these canals have historically been related not just to the flow of the system, but to the problem of labor shortage, which has been a huge constraint on the historical development of, of irrigation. And, and the reason for that, and, and you, you could see that back in that satellite view that I showed you at the beginning, which is that the area surrounding this region is extremely arid. Um, more rainfall up toward the mountains, but very arid as you move further south, essentially desert. So, so um, uh, and then of course there were also these wells, which people talked about. These spread in the, in the, um, late medieval period, there's some debate as to exactly. Isn't that canal? Would you call that a canal? No, I wouldn't. It's a, it's a ditch, but also it's, it, it comes from, you can see the, the wheel in the background there. So it's, it's being pumped out of the ground. So it would be characterized as a well. And all these wells have water courses attached to them. In fact, there are mostly many of these, um, are, are uh, serve many people, and they, they I, I don't want to get into this, they had multiple shares that are associated with the local communities who finance these, but even these are very limited because when the water table falls too far, um, the water simply can't be, can't be pumped. So, uh, sure. So, those aren't, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, so, so there, are, there are a number of canals. I mean, Ferocious canals are uh, in, in um, uh, mostly not in the Indus Basin. They're, they're in the, they're, yeah, 
And, and there were some Mughal canals. I mean, like there's the famous um, Husli Canal that Shah Jahan built, um, and partly to bring water to the Shalimar Gardens, but also there was some irrigation. So I don't want to suggest there were no canals. No, 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 they're not, they're not lined. They're, 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 um, they're simply unlined. Uh, I, I mean, even today, there are many of these canals, most of these inundation canals were not lined. And even today, there are even perennial canals which are not lined. So, Yeah, so this is this is attached to a well. So that would be the connect Yeah. That's that's I mean, I don't know if there's a technical definition on that, but um but any case, just just very quickly, these 18th century canals were associated with many regional states and their construction was quite closely associated with small scale state building in this region. Uh, after the decline of the Mughals, because what happened was uh, various types of warrior elites, like the Nawabs of Bahalpur or the Kaloras in Sindh, or, or various people would uh, invest in these canals, often by drawing in uh, commercial groups who would develop a stake in commercial crops, which could be grown. Uh, and they would then dig these canals and and settle people on them as a foundation for for state building. And much of this was linked to in the 18th century to expanding uh, trade through the Durrani um, Empire. So this is just a very quick background before I get to my first turning point. <laughs> So the first turning point is really, and this again relates to some of the things that Bipal was talking about, which is what I would call the establishment of scientific empire. And by that, I, I, I don't mean that in too rigid a sense. What I mean is that, uh, as I note here, the British had a vision of rule which was linked to the notion that they could command powers of objectivity through science and rational administration to develop a certain type of regime which could control people and control nature. And so this is the era, this map is from the early 20th century. Um, it's really in this era that for the first time you start getting discussions about the river base. And that goes back a bit further into the, into the 19th century. And, and so what is the river basin? So it is, it's a product, as I said here, of, of knowledge, but also of control. There's an imagined control that comes with the assertion of this concept. Um, and it's very closely also associated with um, the development of engineering, uh, the professionalization of engineering in the late 19th century, and with the way the state taps into this as a foundation for its knowledge. So I have a few key terms here. I put this quote from, from an engineer, J.S. Beersford, which in fact is about the Ganges Canal, not the, uh, an Indus Basin Canal, but it's, it's so kind of over the top in its, its uh, vision of this as a kind of mechanical process. That, that it's a useful um, concept to put up there. But these key engineer, engineering terms, I, I put them up to stress the degree to which there is a kind of implicit vision of power and the nature of power and its relationship to nature itself, which is built into professional engineering. And so these terms come up all the time in the technical writing about canal building. So command, a canal command, it's the area, technically speaking, that can be watered by gravity flow from a canal. So land is commanded. It's not commanded by the state itself. It's commanded by the canal, by water. So it's the state turning water 
to its own purposes. Duty, a redolent term. Water is made to do its duty. Actually here, this my definition is slightly off because it's not really a fixed quantity of irrigation water. It's a fixed flow of irrigation water. So here, this is that term, Prasenjit, that you love, QSEX. Duty of water is what can water do to produce? So it's a technical term that, that on any particular canal, water has a particular duty which you can figure out, which is how much land can it turn to productive purposes through flow over a fixed period of time. And then regime is one of the most interesting because regime is the idea of how a canal can be brought to balance. So technically, the regime of a canal is the slope that will balance scouring and silting. And so if you can do that, that means that you don't have to intervene to continuously clean out the canals. So the idea of a regime was that nature, in this case water, could be made to do its work without human labor. And, and so they write all the time about how canal regimes are established, but ultimately it's always, okay, here are the, the, the necessary slopes, here's the nature of the land they flow to, but canals have to, as they often said, find their own regime. It's that the state gives them guidance in doing this. So, so I, I put all this out to stress that all of this has to do with a form of power over nature, but that doesn't capture really what's going on here. It's not power over nature. It's creating a structure which will allow nature itself to do its duty. That is for human production. So this, this is all late 19th century professional engineering. And by the way, there's a very interesting article I've used. Um, it goes back a ways by um, Crosby Smith and Norton Wise, which is about the, the, the foundations of professional engineering ideas in the 19th century, who link this sort of thing, including canal engineering, to um, the, the um, promulgation in the middle of the 19th century of the second law of thermodynamics, that is, of, of that nature is always tending toward disorder. So therefore, nature needs to nudge to bring it into conformity, and that's what professional engineering does. Um, so it is uh, nothing command on uh, Well, well command, command is there. I don't want to deny that at all. But, but I just, there's often a tendency in writing about these things to imagine that, you know, oh, well, power is being exerted over nature without enough care for what nature itself wants. And in point of fact, that's not true. That this is, this, the, you have to understand nature, and you do that through scientific means, of course, but you have to understand it to make it work for you. You can't just command it to, to do things. So, so then this all gets uh, embodied, they, there's an, uh, uh, an Imperial Indian Irrigation Commission that is uh, formed, which reports in 1901, and there are various things that lead to this, including some of the famines that, that, that Vipul talked about. But with respect to the Indus Basin, one of the most interesting developments is the testimony from uh, S.L. Jacob, who was the chief engineer of Punjab, who basically said, look, the big problem with irrigation so far is it's been too fragmented. That we deal with this canal here, that canal here, without understanding when you think about a river basin, all these things are interlinked. So he says, if we do that, we can then make the canal really do its work with us, and, and it's by making all water useful and irrigating as much land as you can possibly work out. And here, uh, that means inundation canals are not enough. You can't wait for, you know, the water to come 
every summer, you have to build weirs. And so this is part of the, uh, uh, of the story. And this in partly leads to it partly as a product of the creation of these, uh, what were known as canal colonies in, in Punjab, where uh, the first is opened in 1892, whereby water through what were called perennial canals, that is canals with a fixed weir, uh, raise the water level so water can flow year round. And the big thing with that is, if water can flow year round, you can send the canals out into the desert, which you could not do before because if water dries up, you know, during the winter and it's too deep for wells, as it was in much of these areas, people can't survive. There's no water. So the perennial canals are, are critical for this um, uh, expansion of irrigation. And what happens is settlers are brought in and I'll say a bit more about the, them in a second to, to um, settle this land and make it productive. And this, this first canal colony then leads, and this is a direct result of Jacob's testimony, to this vast project which is completed in 1915, it takes 10 years to build, which is the so-called Triple Canal Project. And the, the, the big thing in the pr Triple Canal Project is it's not just canals off the rivers, it's what they call link canals. And so link canals carry water from one river to another. And what that does is allows you to balance the flow so that this huge lower Buridoa project, which takes off from the river Ravi, uh, there wasn't enough water in the river to do this, so they bring these two link canals from the Jhelum to the Chenab, then to the Ravi. And then this is followed shortly thereafter by the, the Sucker um, Canal project down here in Sindh, which opens in the early 1930s. And with that, that's a huge project. And with that, you really get this, this integrated uh, um, river basin. Um, and and so, so certain characteristics of this, this system. So I've already talked about the ideology behind this, and I want to say more about that. But, but just to say, and this goes straight back to Jacob's thing about irrigate every inch of land you can and use every drop of water. The result of this is that water, as a later report said, was spread thinly and widely, which meant that although this was a way to curtail pastoralism and bring water to all the land, but yet what it meant was shortages were built into the system. There was never enough water, which meant from the very beginning, and this is the case right up to the present day, there are relatively low levels of productivity in, in, this, in this system. But also, and this is, is critical, that it leads to conflicts over water becoming pervasive in this system. And, and this is at the provincial level, as I'll discuss in a second, but also at the most local level in every village. There, there's the allocations of water in each village are never enough to actually allow for crops to be brought to maturity on all the land. So, so that, that creates this notion of technical, what I've called here technical mediation, that is that the engineers need to mediate these conflicts. But a point of fact, they are never capable of extending this system effectively into the villages. And so what happens is that this system interfaces with structures of what we might call local community, but local community of a very distinct sort that is defined largely through you know, mediation, patronage, tribe, and lineage, or what I've called blood, which is linked to land control. So just quickly on this, this is a critical backdrop to the system. This is a, this is actually from, sorry, Richard Somera's Smith's book on, on um, 
Punjab settlements. Um, but it's a map of, of Ludhiana Tessil, which is actually in, in East Punjab. But what it shows is, as the British did these settlements, what they did in every village as they developed land rights, they also developed a vision of the village and village community, which was tied to kinship and lineage and blood. And in fact, this is directly related to this technical transformation going on at the same time. Because this was a domain of science. The people themselves were defined by you know, what I would call another form of nature, which is blood. And, and Sumara Smith really brings this out clearly that, you know, as he says, there's this discussion, this modern advance being linked to a movement from status to contract. And what he argues in his book is that even as that argument is being made, the British are going out of their way to make sure that village community is defined not by contract, but by status. So, and that's so it can be separated from this realm of rule, realm of power that's associated with, with the British themselves. And this has a huge impact on these canal colonies. This is the district of Lyalpur, which in fact is that Chenab colony I showed you a second ago. And as it settled, and this is a settlement map from the 1930s, but each village, you can see the canal lines, but each village is marked out according to who, as they say, the proprietors are. So in this case, in the yellow areas, these are, these are what they call junglies, which is a derogatory term that the British used in these reports for settled pastoralists. But in each case, which the map doesn't show you, this is linked to what they saw as their tribal identities, their lineage-based identities. And then there are these others that are all lumped together, which are really caste names like, like Arains and, and Jats and, uh, and other groups. So this is very typical. So, so to sum up what happened with this first turning point, uh, on the one hand, this river basin idea is tied to a new claim to authority by the, by the colonial state. But built into this is a kind of notion that this whole thing hinges between what we might call a modern technical structure, which is how the British are controlling water, their ally in all this. Um, while on the other hand, local society, as they say, beyond the outlet, beyond the canal outlet, is a product of tradition, lineage, patronage, nature in a different form. Um, and and uh, so, so this leads to a, a built-in tension into this this system, and one could go into a lot more detail about how this plays out in various ways. But I don't want to do that. I want to go on to turning point number two. <laughs> and turning point number two has to do with the moment in 1947. And I don't want to pin this down to a specific date, but you know, why not? Uh, the creation of nation states as successors to this colonial regime. And here, this takes a very dramatic form because this, this, in 1947, the British, of course, partition India, the old British India, into two new states, India and Pakistan. But as they do so, they also partition the Indus Basin. And they partition this river basin that they'd gone out of their way to define as a kind of unity of nature. So this, is, this map shows the, the Radcliffe line that was kind of drawn right, right through the middle. And, and the point I want to make here is that there are continuities for sure between this and the colonial vision, but there's also a big difference. The difference is now the state claims an authority, a moral authority, which is tied not just to its reason, its rationality, its technical control over nature, but also to its representation of the people themselves. 
So it's, it's built into this. There's a strong attack on this notion of society composed only of these blood-based groups. In fact, this is quite explicit when you look at the, the nationalist movements that lead up to this. So, so then the question is, how does this get, get played out, this new idea of the people sort of having a new relationship to the system? So the most dramatic way has to do with the mobilizations around control of water that are linked to partition itself. So this is all brought to a head when uh, the partition occurred in August 1947. On April 1st, 1948, India blocked, stopped the flow of water across a series of canals that this is the, the Radcliffe line right here and which split these two cities in Punjab, Amritsar and Lahore. And this here is, there are a number of these canals, but this is the Lahore branch of the upper Buri Doab system, which flows right through the city of Lahore. And this, I, this photograph here is actually a much more recent photograph from, uh, it's from six or seven years ago of the canal going through Lahore. But what it suggests is, during the summer, the hot weather, how much this canal is actually part of the life of the city. And what happened on April 1st, 1948, was the flow in that canal was stopped. And one thing one, thing one would have to know about the, uh, the, um, the climate in this, in this area, that in fact, this April is already the hot weather. And it's already a time when people would be using the canal. So this, this actually um, creates a crisis. And there's a, a meeting held, a special meeting held in Delhi in early May. And the, the, the flow is reopened. But this has later ramifications. I don't want to get into as to what the agreement was. But, but nevertheless, Pakistan then develops this sense that they're under siege, their environment is under siege, and special measures have to be taken. So immediately after they come back, they begin constructing this huge new canal, the Bamanwala, Ravi, Bania, and Depalpur Canal, or just BRBD Canal, uh, which, which is intended to run right along the border in order to intercept all of the canals that flowed from India so that if India stops the water, they can still be, be fed. And so you on the top there, you can see it running right across the border, but it goes up to, it's, it links into one of those big link canals from the uh, Triple Canal uh, project. So this, the building of this canal is interesting. In fact, it, it takes some time to be completely completed. But there's this kind of ethos of mass patriotic mobilization that surrounds this canal. So this is a, a, a newspaper photograph of students coming out of Lahore. And you know there they are with their pickaxes and shovels working on the canal. I mean, one can imagine how efficient this, this was. Uh, villages themselves were mobilized rather than contracts being let out, as would be the case in most canals. Each village was organized to dig their segments of the canal. And politicians went out and gave these speeches of exhortation about protecting Pakistan. So this canal really was tied into a nationalist mobilization. And, and this actually comes to a kind of fruition in the 1965 war between India and Pakistan, when this canal becomes very important in the strategy stopping uh, an invasion of Lahore. And, and it's referred to in the newspapers as the Ghazi Canal, which is you know, a warrior for Islam. So, so all this suggests a particular kind of nationalist mobilization, which is something which would have been unthinkable under the colonial regime. But having said that, none of this effectively solves the problem of the border. And, and so what happens is, and this already is, is, is a concern by 1950, 1951, the question is, 
how do we actually negotiate some kind of broader deal between India and Pakistan about this water problem. So the, the key thing that starts this negotiation is a, uh, an article that's written by David Lilienthal, who was the chairman of the TVA in the United States, and who, who went on a tour of India in, in 1951 and saw this problem and wrote this article, and it's called, I mean, the Cold War context couldn't be clearer, another Korea in the making. Um, his argument was that what can transcend this kind of, as he saw it, narrow nationalism was an appeal to nature and ultimately an appeal to this vision of the river basin as a unified nat national entity. So this is really a fascinating article because you can see here, I mean, what, what he, he says partition is a political, politico-religious instrument and based on politics and emotion. And what you need to get beyond that is something higher, something more rational. And that, of course, is thinking about the river basin itself. And, and the way he framed this was actually, you can see it more clearly in some of the other things he wrote. But this is, I mean, this is, to my mind, a, a, one of a really sort of fascinating statement of this. So this is before. But, but it's a kind of, the river basin is a kind of universal culture. There's a kind of technical universalism here, a kind of morality that transcends all local interest. So he has this great discussion, whoops, this great discussion here, and you know, we actually have a reference to North Carolina, uh, about, you know, how, you know, if you see, this is the, this is the, a universal language, this kind of material understanding of man's relationship to nature. And, and um, that, that, you know, it, it's, it's just, if I were to relate this back to something this morning, I, I would relate it to this, to this, you know, your references to Mencius. It's like this is all under heaven. This is, it doesn't matter if you're Chinese or Indian or Peruvian, there's a kind of moral universal that's involved. But here it's not to some kind of Confucian morality, it's to just the way nature dictates man's needs through very material processes. So, so what happens in the wake of this is, um, Lilienthal gets in touch with Eugene Black, who is the president of the World Bank, and the bank agrees to mediate, set up talks to mediate between India and Pakistan based on the, the outline of uh, Lilienthal's uh, proposal, and they get India and Pakistan both to agree to this. So this leads to a big question, which is, why would India and Pakistan agree to something in these terms? Because when you look back to, to what Lilienthal said, he's basically dismissive of Indian and Pakistani nationalism. He says, you know, you're, you're, this is emotion and, and, you know, go back. I mean, it's, it's such a reference back to this colonial vision of a river basin that defines a kind of rational power. And, and, and that transcends local conflict and interests and all this. So why would they agree? And, and the answer, I think, is because this is very useful for both the leaders of India and Pakistan as well, because they're facing tremendous internal conflicts based on all kinds of local, provincial identities. And this kind of vision of science and the river basin is really powerful as a way to assert the authority of the state, the national state. So this is this relates very much. Nehru is quite explicit about this. He he 
in fact, he, he makes certain conditions about participating. Um, but nevertheless, you know, his ideology is reflected in this famous speech he gave not long after uh, this Temples of Modern India speech uh, at, at the opening of part of the Bakra Dam project, which is the first big dam project in the Indus Basin. And, you know, where he says, you know, this, this vision of man being in tune with nature is like a divine, uh, sacred mission. And it puts him, and this is actually, I, I can't go into the detail about this, but, but in fact, there, there's much more explicit notion here about how this is contrary to the appeals that have been made by you know, people in Punjab in particular, which are, are kind of narrower and self-interested. And so he's very much trying to take this larger view. And the same, this is, you know, um, Ayub Khan from uh, uh, Pakistan. But, but, and this is a quote from him from the same time, 1954, though Ayub Khan doesn't stage Pakistan's first military coup until 1958. So this is before that. But nevertheless, you know, he makes, this is at the time when Pakistan for, in order to create a kind of central state which could stand above the divisions between East Pakistan and West Pakistan is consolidating West Pakistan into one unit, which is what this is about. But the language here couldn't be clear. clear. Provincial boundaries are artificial. Uh, you know, the creation, the, these prejudices of provincial identity or local interests are more the creation of politicians than real. What's real? The river basin. Nature's, uh, uh, nature's reality. So, so this all leads to this. Yeah, OK, so let me just quick, quick gallop to the end here. This, this leads to the um, signing of the Indus Water Treaty, the Indus Waters Treaty in 1960. But the interesting thing is, once they get into this negotiation, since they're interested in the state uh, being the vehicle for this ideology, they're very resistant to any joint authority. And so what happens is the final uh, discussion, the final uh, uh, Indus Waters Treaty result is that the, the river basin itself is, is really partitioned, that nature is partitioned. Three rivers are given to Pakistan, three rivers to India. And then you have, very quickly here, then you have on each side the government re trying to remake the river basin as, as a new unit. But, but the one thing to, to sum this up is that ultimately this leads to huge conflict on both sides uh, of the border because if the central state can claim authority deriving from the river basin, so can the provinces. And, and this really comes to a head when conflict erupts between Punjab and the central uh, state in India, which, which the assassination of Indira Gandhi, of course, was, was part of that. But, but this, this big Rajasthan Canal, which was part of um, uh, the, the project, is then renamed the Indira Gandhi Canal to nationalize it, to kind of slap Punjab in the face and say, this is, this, this is a national project. And if Punjab isn't getting enough water, tough luck. And, but. In Punjab, this claim is made that, you know, they're the real river basin. This the Indian government is just playing with reconstructing this artificial river basin. And so they go back to the name Five Rivers, which is the literal meaning of Punjab. But but of course, the, the point there is that two of the five rivers are now in Pakistan. But that it's also Punjab, yes, of course. Though though they they don't, they are not wanting to undo partition, but the old river basin serves this ideological function, and the same 
The same on the Pakistani side. Uh, the, the remaking of the Western rivers leads to this just huge project in Pakistan, the Indus Basin project, which vast foreign funding goes into. In fact, this was the biggest irrigation project in history, in the history of the world, in, in, uh, um, when it was started after 1960. And, and Wapta House, the West, the Water and Power Development Authority of West Pakistan, is constructed, I, I don't know if any of you have been to Lahore, but, but the, the symbolism of this is just quite remarkable. Here, Queen Victoria used to be under this canopy in the middle of this square, Al-Fala Square in downtown Lahore. Um, the, the Pakistanis removed Queen Victoria, this isn't until a little after that, but put in a kind of stone Quran as a kind of sign of ultimate sovereignty. But nevertheless, where is real sovereignty? Wapta House just looms over this. In fact, over here, you can't see it, is the Punjab Provincial Assembly, the elected assembly of the province. And it's also dwarfed by Wapta House, which tells you something. So um, let me stop there. Um, and uh, yeah, sorry to have gone over. Presented.